Welcome to the 41st edition of Life Story, brought to you by Thelma Podcasts and the Living Memory Association. Today we're joined by the remarkable Terry Christie, former head teacher of Musselburgh Grammar School and successful part-time football manager of Meadowbank Thistle, Stenhouse Muir and Aloha Athletic. Carving out two careers at the same time, over nearly 40 years, Terry played professional football for Dundee, Wraith Rovers and Stirling Albion, ahead of a move into football management whilst teaching at St David's and Dalkeith, Forrester High, Portobello High School and Trinity Academy, before head teacher roles at both Ainsley Park and Musselburgh Grammar. Terry paints a wonderful picture of a busy life lived to the full, in the classroom and on the touchline. Back in time we go. A very warm welcome to Life Story today to Terry Christie, who joins us in the Thelma Studios. How are you doing, Terry? Fine, thank you. A bit of a sore throat, so I'm a wee bit croaky, but other than that, I'm in, I'm in good nick. Hopefully we'll get through it. I'm going to take you way, way back to beyond when you were actually born. Can you just tell me a little bit about your parents and how they ended up in Edinburgh? Well, I'm actually Irish, and my parents were Irish. My mother, they were born in a little place called Arigna in County Roscommon. The biggest town is Carrick and Shannon. They both came over in 1937 to get work. Erigna is the only place in Ireland that has coal mines, but my dad was a bit claustrophobic and he didn't fancy that. And he had loads of relatives in Scotland, and lots of the people from Erigna came over as miners to get jobs in the Lothians, and he had uh, relatives in Broxburn and in West Lothian and he came over stayed with them and then my mother followed him in 1937 And what did your dad do when he came across here then? What was his first job? He became a labourer in building sites like many Irish people he was a powerful man a big you know, by the standards then he was he was reckoned to be tall he'd be about five ten and a half you know I didn't get any of his height and he was a powerful strong man and he was a labourer and then he graduated to become a crane driver not one of the things up high but one of these on caterpillars and he did that until his death in 19, when he, he died when he was 56 when I was mm. 25 uh, mainly because of just his alcohol like he liked to paint and so on and yeah. didn't do any exercise but he was a great man he was a, a real big Irish man his pals called him Paddy and mm-hmm. and so on you know he was, he was a smashing a great lad and so whereabouts did you grow up Terry and what are your earliest memories well my, I actually was born in Nicholson Street right opposite in a single end right opposite the Festival Theatre in a little single end way at the very very top uh, when I was 10 months my dad met an old guy in a pub I managed to do a swap where the old guy got a few bob and took the single end in Nicholson Street and we went to a council house in Logan Lee Drive. You know, Logan Lee, just a creek and tinny just between Portobello yeah. and Lock End. And that's where uh, that's where I was brought up. And where do you remember playing? Where did, were you, was it in the street? Remember hanging about in the streets? Was there a oh, park? or? Oh, well, there was no grass then. I mean, I was born in 1942, December 1942. So I'm a, a war baby. Fought the, <laughs> the war for you guys. <laughs> I actually do remember getting carried down into an air raid shelter because they were always bombing Leith, which was nearby. But the, but after the war, there was no grass. There was, uh, you know, and we played in the streets. There was no cars. If a car came along the street, the dogs chased the car. So we, we played in the street. We had tennis balls. Nobody, nobody played tennis, but we always seemed to have tennis balls for football. And in the local school playground, I played. Uh, at Craig and Tinney Primary, I used to go down when I was eight and nine in practice, there was a big wall there, hit the ball against the wall. So we all we did was play football. I mean, I never had... Uh, my family didn't get a television until I was 14. You know, so uh, football was a huge thing. And back in those days, from that part of Edinburgh, everybody supported Hibs. Yeah, and Hibs got fabulous crowds. And being of Irish background, my family were, uh, you know, real keen Hibs supporters. Yeah, so your mum and dad were well into their football as well. My mum particularly. My dad had to work so long hours... And way back then, you know, you, you didn't finish till lunchtime on a Saturday. Mm-hmm. And he actually preferred to go to the pub, Jock's Lodge, just at the top of Smoky Bray, rather than go to see the Hibs. But my mother took my brother and I to all the games and to lots and lots of away games as well. What players do you remember from those days? Well, I, I remember the famous five and yeah, and Gordon Smith. And I actually got to know Gordon Smith, who was a Hibs star. He was a wonderful player. When I signed for Dundee, uh, Gordon Smith was a Dundee joined Dundee and I got to know him pretty well you know and, and he was just a, a great lad an absolute gentleman a quiet spoken man with no airs or graces but on the football field he was something special and going to see Hibs did you have a special place on the terracing where you'd stand or would you dot around <laughs> was there a... no no we had we were we went there for us we'd be there just after two o'clock for the three o'clock kickoff, and we were at the wall behind the goals 
just on the right wing corner so we could see Gordon taking his corners. <laughs> you know, if you're yeah. at the, uh, the Leith end, just there. We were always there nice and early and the mother had us perched on the wall and uh, that was our place. Yeah, there's still something. Like my kids uh, both love live football. As much. They're more interested in going to see live matches than watching it on the TV at the moment. Just there's still something special about being near a player, I think, you know. Uh, I think live live sport's just wonderful. Just like live music, you know, going to a concert's great. I my my son Max manages Bonish United and I got all the games and although maybe the football's not of the highest standard, it still is great to be a live sport. And do you give him tips Terry or do you just leave him to it? I'm sort of a consultant, an athletic <laughs> consultant, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't take my advice in the spirit in which is intended. <laughs> And to take you back again, Terry, what are the memories of the house you grew up in? If you close your eyes and try and walk around it, what what, what sticks out? Is there anything well, we, we had two bedrooms, a toilet, a living room and a scullery. Kitchen mm. suddenly been invented then when you were Scottish. And of course, between the, the living room and the, to- and the, the lavvy was a big, big coal cellar, which the coal was a big thing in your life. And the memories were... It's funny because everybody was poor, but because you're so poor... You, you really didn't realise you were poor. Uh, my treat when I was a wee kid, we had very few food. In Britain after the war was poorer than Britain during the war because we had the least land, we're trying to pay back the money to the Americans. So if I wanted a treat, I used to get the, the government margarine with sugar spread on it and a bit of butter. So we were really, really poor. But everybody was really poor. Yeah. And you just managed and as a kid you had great fun and playing with your pals and so on. And what sort of time would you spend with your... So your mum took you to the football, but would you see much of your dad at the weekend then? Was there, were there much in the way of family activities then? No. no. All the, my dad worked and went to the pub. My mother, and I think with it was general in, in that, at that time that the mothers, if anything was to be done with the kids, it was the mothers that organised it. My mother worked as... had a large number of cleaning jobs. My mother was very, very clever. She would... But, because I've never got a chance, left school at 14 and came over from Ireland and worked in Gullin as a downstairs maid and just got cleaning jobs and she was as smart as anything, you know, she'd have, she'd have been, had a great job if she had had a chance. So anything we did was organised by the mothers and I remember one time we had a trip to Danoon, my mother and she ended up working at the Royal High School Primary at Northfield and the cleaners there organised the trip doing the water for us. It rained all day but it was just wonderful, <laughs> train through to Glasgow and a boat down to Danoon and all the mothers. So my mother did everything for, with us. My dad was a, a loving, caring guy, but uh, he only came to see me playing football once, and that was when St Ninians, which was when we went to the local uh, primary school. We won the Epsa Cup when I was 12 in 1955, and he was at that game. Mm-hmm. But that was the only time he ever saw me play football, whereas my mother would see me playing football all the time. Yeah, and did you play well in that one game your dad I, came to see? I did play well. I, oh, I won the cup, and uh, it's a memory I cherish. And... Your mum, she was the cook of the house then. Are there any meals that you used to eat when you were wee that you don't eat anymore? Any foods? <laughs> well, my mother was, you know, her, her heart wasn't in cooking. You know, mm. she was, my dad was actually a better cook and his speciality was on a Sunday morning we'd have a big fry up. Mm. He'd be out in the bevy on this Saturday night and he loved a nice greasy, which didn't help his heart, meal on the Sunday. We always had steak on the Sunday and we'd have that after mass. There was only four of us in the family. My mum, my dad, my brother, and, and myself and my brother didn't go to mass my brother uh, Peter is a well known character in Leith and he he was not the religious type but my mother and I went to, to church to mass every every Sunday and we'd come back and our dad would have this big slap up meal for us which was mm. great Did your family just accept that Peter wasn't a religious guy then? Did they just say he just doesn't want to do it that's fair enough there was no trying to get him along? or Well you could write a book about Peter Peter, <laughs> Peter became a professional shoplifter Right. And Peter couldn't actually go to church because rather than putting money in plate, I don't know if you know, but in the Catholic church, the plate come down and you're supposed to put a few mm. bob in the, cl- in the plate. Well, Peter perfected the art of taking money out the plate <laughs> rather than putting it in. <laughs> so he was a bit of an embarrassment, so we're happy for him. We're happy for- my mother was delighted that he stayed at home with my dad. <laughs> Peter <laughs> actually had a good laugh why he didn't go to church. In those days, the... the uh, the Mass was in Latin, and part of the Mass, the priest would turn to the, the congregation and he'd go, Kyrie Eleison, Kyrie Eleison, Christi Eleison, Christi Eleison, which was God of mercy, God of mercy. It's a Greek part of the Mass, and then Christ of mercy, Christ of mercy. And Peter said, well, he went to church, and the, the priest turned around and he said, Kyrie Eleison, and then Peter interpreted that as Christi Eleison. <laughs> <laughs> he said, the priest started abusing me. <laughs> so that was his excuse for never going back. 
<laughs> and going back to primary school sort of time, Terry, who were your earliest friendships? Who were your first pals that you remember? Well, actually, I have pals that I still see today. Jimmy Casey, George McCann, Joe Hegger, Terry, they were... You know, we had great pals there, uh, and I still see these guys today. The primary school was terrific. I just loved my primary school, just loved sitting in the ends and everything about it. Did you go for any holidays when you were younger? No, no holidays. We went. My mother came over in 1937, but she hadn't been back home. And in 1937, she was 22. And then the war came, and she never got back home. But in 1946, when I was three, my brother, who was two years older than me, my mother took us over to Ireland to see her mother. Mm -hmm. And we went to Arigna. Uh, My dad couldn't come because uh, he had to work. And that was terrific. We were in, we see, and the poverty that they had was incredible. My mother was, the place my mother was born in had no running water, no electricity, no toilet. It was a place like you'd think, you would hardly keep animals in it nowadays. Yeah. And she, if she wanted to toilet, you had to go up on a hill. In Arigna, there's lots of peat, so their the fuel was peat, but there, and there's a little stream run by their, their cottage, and that was their water. So it was abject poverty, it really was. And it always stuck with me getting on the, the boat at the Brumelaw, in 1946, and there was still a big gun on the, on the merchant vessel, and uh, good over talent. I'll never, I'll never forget that. It's been a memory, even though it was only three at the time. A memory, a treasure. And does the Christie family connection with Ireland continue? Do you, does any part of the family still go back and see relatives over there? Well, when my mother was getting on, you know, I was always busy because I was running football teams in a big school. But I took a few days every Easter holiday for my daughter and I. Remember, about six years in succession, would go for five days at Easter, take her back home to see her, to see her folks. And then my mother passed away, and I haven't been back since. And I'm always meaning I'm going to go back since because they're wonderful. Uh, I've got loads of cousins and relatives in that area of Arigna. Yeah, uh, it's really, and they're great folks. So I keep meaning to say I'll have to go back and see them. And going on to football terry at St Ninians, were you a good player right from the start? Yeah, I mean, did you right away just take to it and just all the practice? That, did you? Yeah, uh, if you want to be a, a f- footballer, and now let me say at the start, I wasn't any great player. I played mm. for 14 years. If yeah. you want to be kind to me, you could say I was maybe a journeyman footballer, right? <laughs> But I was good enough to be a professional footballer for 14 years. And it, it, to be a professional footballer, you have to have skill. But to get to the professional level, you have to be fairly strong and athletic, but as, well, as well as having a bit of skill. Although I was small, I was stocky and strong and hard, yeah. to, hard to knock off the ball. And I was always pretty good. I was in the school team at eight playing with the 12-year-olds. Wikipedia lists you as both a full-back and a winger. I take it you started up front and went back as your career progressed? Well, I went back as my career progressed. I was actually midfield for some of the time, but I was a winger midfielder. And then, you know, as I got... A wee bit older, I went back to became a wee fullback. I started a wee winger, a wee midfielder, and ended up a wee fullback. <laughs> <laughs> and the Ninians team was good then, was it? They have a, did, were you playing for your school team and a boys' club team then, or just the no? There was no school? boys' clubs then at that age. The boys' clubs didn't kick in until under 17 football. So I only played for my school team, and we had a, a, a really good school team. You know, we had well, you know we had a, we had a good school team. We won at the cup. We beat St Bernards in the final down at Warriston, which was a great day for us. Moving on to secondary school, Terry. Which secondary school did you go to? Uh, Holy Cross Academy down in Ferry Road then, which was the you had to pass your quali to get to Holy Cross. Yeah. So I went to Holy Cross with about four or five others from my class went to Holy Cross and the others that didn't pass a call went to St Anthony's and some of the girls went to St Thomas's. And are those happy memories, secondary school? Well, second, uh, oh, secondary school, very happy memories. Although Holy Cross was, it was great, but it was terrible as well because if you breathe too heavily, you got belted, you know, the belt, mm. they just hammered you. And it was one or two of the teachers needed really to be locked up, you know, they were just belting yeah. the kids for fun. But... There were some great teachers and lots of very, very clever kids and, and uh, I, I, I loved that school as well, you know. I always loved school and learning things. And What were that. your favourite subjects? What were you strongest in? Uh, maths and science. And I, was, <laughs> I don't want to appear in modest, but I was quite good at them all. The things that I, the things <laughs> that I couldn't do were art, te- anything to do with your hands, hopeless. But English and history and, and anything to do with logic and that, I was, uh, I was good at that. First romances at secondary school, Terry. Are you willing to discuss any of those? Not really. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I had when I was in six year. It was a girl, Mary Boyle, who was a lovely girl. So her and I had a had a one or two. We were sort of quite keen on each other for a while. Yeah. You know, I didn't have much time. I was always interested in girls, can I say? But I think they were less interested in me. If you're small and stocky, you're not just a girl's dream. <laughs> 
<laughs> so what, how long did, did you stay on for the full six years of Holy Cross then? Or yes, did you? I, I stayed right on to six years. I was ducks on Holy Cross, can I tell you, which was quite a feat because Holy Cross back in those days used to take kids who'd passed a quality from as far east as almost Cullen yep. to an end and as far west as getting on for Broxburn. So I... Uh, that was 1960, was it? In 1960, I was Ducks at Holy Cross and left in 1961 to study chemistry at Edinburgh University. And at that point, you still playing football. You're a player at the same time. Yeah, well, I joined Edinburgh Norton, who had a crack juvenile team when I was 15 and played for them. Uh, and they were, they were a great club with great players. And, and then I, at 17, uh, I, signed, I got spotted and signed for Dundee and became a part-time professional footballer when I was still at school. At that point, when you signed up to study chemistry, was the main focus in your head thinking, I'm going to be a professional footballer or I'm going to go a different direction? Or was it all up in the air, were you not? No, I, I, don't, I don't be inclined. Like all kids when they're that age, I knew the the big man and the kind of, you know, when you're playing, you're the best team and player on the team. And then you go up, I went up to Dundee, it was Alan Gilseed. Mm. Andy Penman was the same age as me. You know, Ian Ewer, and quickly I realised, well, I fancy myself a little bit, but these guys are all better than me. So yeah. I quite quickly realised I loved football, I was going to do my best at it, but I realised that my main route, if I was going to do anything, was the academic route. Yeah. And so just to nip back to the first point that you were scouted, how, how did that unfold? Did someone come and speak to your mum on the touchline or speak to you well, directly, or how was it in those days? Well, I was playing for Ember Norton and, and we played a game out at Kerstorfen at Union Park and somebody said, oh, there's a Dundee scout watching you. No, I never knew who it was. Then the next game was at Woods Park in Portobello, which no longer is there. Yep. They built loads of houses on it. And then I went to that match and I recognised Sammy Keane, who'd been a hips player. And I saw him there and he was from Indies. So before the game, I thought, oh, he's maybe here to watch me. I miscontrolled the ball the first time it came to me. <laughs> but after that, I played, uh, I played well. And they approached the people after the match and I met the Dundee manager at Bin's Corner and I agreed to sign. But my dad was working in our broth, building a new school. So I didn't want to sign without giving my dad the, you know, a chance to approve it. Yeah. So I went up to uh, Dundee, met Bob Shankler, the the, uh, the manager at the time of Dundee, and he drove me to our broth and met my dad, and my dad okayed it, and I signed for Dundee. And was there any haggling with terms at that oh, point? No, was it no. just, a, just an agreement made? Yeah. Oh, I, I wasn't really that interested in the money. Any money, we had no money, so any money yeah. was going to be any, going to be great. I yeah. ended up, I was actually well paid for it. Although I was in the reserves all the time, Dundee were very successful. They won the league in 63, 62, 63, and uh, all the players were promoted, and I ended up making more money. I was making more money playing for Dundee reserves than my dad was. And so how much of your wage packet would go back to your folks? Well... I don't think much went back to it. I think my mother would just put it all away from me, you know. No, I don't, they don't. They never took anything. And they were poor, but they didn't take any money from me. You're most well known for being a successful manager, Terry, but can you just quickly take us through your playing career and your proudest moments on the pitch? <laughs> well, not many proud moments on the pitch. I started with Dundee and I was five years with Dundee, so I was obviously... And they were a top team. They were vying with Rangers and Celtic. So, you know, I was a, I was a technically good little player, you know, but not good enough to get in the first team. So eventually Bob Shankly left, and I must have played about 150 games in the reserves. There was a, a select pick, Scotland reserve team select, and I played in that, I remember, but I was not going, you know, and eventually I got freed, and I went to Wraith Rovers for a year with George Farm manager. I hated that, and then him and I didn't get on. It was, compared to Dundee, it was sort of a badly run club, and I just never took it there. And I'd been training at Meadowbank Stadium and Willie McFarlane was manager of Hoyleville Labour in East of Scotland League and he was always on me to sign. So they gave me a bit of money and I was so fed up that I left and what got released from my contract at Heath Rovers and played for two years in the East of Scotland League with Willie McFarlane down at, uh, for Hoyt Royal Albert. And that was great, you know, they were, they were a great team, they were too good and I, it was a, a level below what I should have been playing at. Malcolm Bogey and I were sort of... The, to, to the best players in the league and we did really well and then Willie got the job at Stirling Albion and he took me to Stirling Albion when I was 25 and I had six years at Stirling Albion so that got me to 31 they released me and I became player manager at Newton Green Star for four years and then Willie McFarlane took me as assistant manager to Medibank Thistle and he got sacked after two years and I became manager Right. Can I just, uh, just a quick question. When your playing career came to an end, did you find it hard to deal with that you weren't a player anymore? It's a natural progression. 
you yeah. could see yourself, you know, getting old. Now, then I thought when you were, you were 30, and back back then you were getting a wee bit over the hill. Now it's about 33, 34, the players play longer, and I could see myself slowing down a wee bitty. So it was a natural progression, and I was always keen to be a manager, you know, I'm very opinionated and, you know, I'm a bit bossy, and I, th- I always fancy myself to be a manager. And when did the idea of teaching enter your head as a possible career path? I was always going to be a teacher because my mother had a relative, her mother's cousin as a teacher and they called him Master McCran and he was a pride of the family. My mother was a McGreevy but her mother was a McCran and they, they so my mother was intent on my, my being a teacher. After the war and you were a wee poor boy you didn't there wasn't the job opportunities teaching was thought oh if I could be a teacher that'd be great and I loved schools. People used to say what are you going to be turns? I was always turns until I started football and I would never say them but I always knew I was going to be a teacher. So on the timeline of your kind of journey through life when you come to the end of your football career at 31 where are you in the teaching side of things? I was uh, a deputy head teacher at Portobello High School I was assistant head then but they call it deputy now Mm. so I was a deputy head teacher at Portobello High School it was Actually, I was playing for Stirling Albion and being a debut head teacher there at Portobello. And so, uh, you know, and a job of a lot with a lot of responsibilities. And I also into, wanted to be a manager. Going into the teaching profession in the first place, before you became deputy head, given that it had always been the, the kind of family dream and your dream, was teaching everything you expected it to be? It is, it is difficult, but uh, no, teaching was a job made for me. And my daughter's now a teacher and she, I think she's a great teacher. If you're of an extrovert nature, a bit of a show-off, <laughs> and you get to close the door and have 20 or 30 impressionable kids, you know, <laughs> you like the job. And I, I, I loved it. I really did. And so your deputy head at that point when your playing career finishes so you're player, player manager for a while at Newton Grange Stars I was right? aye, yeah. aye for, for, for the whole of the first season and after that I sort of phased myself out or I got phased yeah. out I phased myself <laughs> out yeah and is that is it always a bit a, when I see successful player managers like Kenny Dalgleish and I would just think how difficult it must be to go from being a teammate having a laugh in the dressing room to make that transition into being the boss did you find that hard? I did I did find that hard and I found playing hard you know, although I'd come down from, from Stirling Albion, with been, if it was Stirling Albion team were a good team, but there'd have been a championship team nowadays, so I'd have been playing in the, the championship, you know. But I found it hard being a player manager, and I really underperformed. I didn't do that well, you know, as player manager because of the, the things you said, the pressures of it. And then, so I decided after... Well, I was 32 now to be uh, not to be player manager, but I keep would bring myself back in, you know. I think, but then that didn't work out all that well. Player manager is very, very, very difficult, I think. And so, can you just tell us how how did the leap from Newton Grange Star to Meadowbank Thistle happen? Then, how did that move come about? Well, Newton Grange Star did very well. You know, we we had a good team, uh, and I was there four years, and we won lots of cups and had a good bit of success. We won a national trophy, which was a national driver, which was you know quite a thing. And Willie McFarlane had been manager of Hibs, and then he was out of football. And Meadowbank had been for Thistle, had become Meadowbank Thistle, and were struggling. And the manager, I think, packed in, and they appointed Willie McFarlane. And Willie McFarlane was a bit of a character. Him and I were great friends. You know, and I'd done well at, at Newton Grange. He knew me from Hoyek, but I always had plenty to say about the tactical side of things. So then it was all, he then asked me to be assistant manager. And were you always interested in the tactical side of things? Yeah, even I always from the early was. Days? Yeah. Well, I always was as I got older. I became a qualified coach very early when I was 25, 26. I went to all the coaching courses. I went down to England and became an FA coach. You know, I was steeped in that. I was desperately keen to learn about football and the tactical side of it. And putting your theories into practice. Ah, yes, exactly. Yeah. Obviously, there's, there's all sorts of written material about the success of the ball to the near post and the goals you scored from the near post. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I haven't read your book a while back. It amused me how other managers would become annoyed at that. Like it was almost too simple a tactic. They'd be annoyed that you'd just keep using it because it kept working. It kept working. We just did the same thing all the time. But we had great kickers. For corners to be effective, you have to have great kickers of the ball. And the ball's got to be not too long in the air. So we would drive the ball just over head height. Tom Henry, Mickey Lawson, Graham Armstrong were great strikers of the ball. And then I had a lot of tall players because I decided a lot of my managerial career, if you're going to have a bad player, get a, get a tall bad player. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so quite early I got rid of the wee guys and we, we tended always to be bit good, strong, big athletic teams and for a while I had Grant, a big lad called Grant Tierney and Moti Boyd and they were dynamite in the air you know just nicking it in and we played Queen's Park one game and uh, the game was I think about seven minutes old and we were 3-0 up at Hamden 
and we scored three from the three goals from corner kicks. And that particular move, uh, did that come from the training that you did? In the, well, or was that a? Well, I actually played at Broth, and I saw them packing the near post and giving us all sorts of bother. So I thought, mm. well, I'm going to do that. Yeah. And we did practice it a lot. Practice it unopposed, never with the defenders, just getting the idea, trying to get success. You know, the players doing it unopposed, hit yeah. the ball in. And uh, and it worked well. And it, I took that to Stennis Muir and Allo and we scored loads of goals yeah. there as well. I'd imagine it would run absolutely riot just now against that zone defence a lot of them do these days. <laughs> well, yeah, well, it's difficult to do because you have to have exceptional kickers of the ball. You know, they have to be able to put the ball in the danger areas with pace on it at a good height. And then you have to have tall lads who can have got a sense, you know, really how to... Flick the ball. We had what what a lad, what a boy. That he was six feet one, six feet two, and he would just let him graze his head and yeah. end up in the net. You know, because yeah, it's just was, a glancing header. You need, isn't it? He, just, he could do that. It's, I think it's one of the things I'm most surprised about in the professional game these days is the quality, the poor quality of a lot of the crossing. You know, not just from dead ball situations, but you know, seeing the ball booted way over the box to the other side. Just how how can professional footballers be doing that? I don't well, funny get it. Enough, Craig Brown, the ex Scotland manager, was a great friend of mine because we were teammates up at Dundee, so we're close friends. But I remember when the Scotland manager saying to me, you know, we we can't want your short corner, your corner kicks in here because we don't have anybody good enough, <laughs> you know, to, to yeah. deliver. You know, they had David Cooper, I thought so he'd never done it. <laughs> But, you know, he said they didn't have the delivery and yeah. they, that's why they couldn't do it. And how did that first spell at Meadowbank come to an end? Well, Meadowbank, I was there 12 years and it was, uh, for a football manager, it was heaven on earth. We had such success and we had a yeah. terrific team and with some really good players. You were very close to promotion, weren't you, to the top league? We had changed it. We finished second from what is now the championship and we'd have gone into the Premier League. We would have, we would have got hammered in the Premier League. Mm. But, you know, we did really well. We got the semi-final of the in the League Cup can beat my Rangers home and away. It came to an end because you know, the club was for Antithistle and when for Antithistle very unexpectedly became a league club, they asked uh, John Blacklaw, who was uh, one of the senior workers there, if he, the Ferranti people asked them if he would take over running this club, which, which bore the company name and was going to become Meadowbank and Thistle. And John did, and John had in a very hurried drop of constitution, and he, he made a founders members club, which was the, the people who worked at Ferranti's, they were to be the, the owners of the club. And that worked fairly well for a few years, but then as the club got successful, John found the founder members having to answer to people a bit irksome, so he mm. stopped having AGMs. <laughs> so we were being run sort of unconstitutionally. And then Bill Hunter wanted to get involved and Bill was putting sponsoring games and putting a wee bit of money into the club and really pestering never off John Blacklaw to let him in. And eventually John Blacklaw let Bill in. Now Bill and I are oil and water in terms of the characters. You know, Bill just wasn't my cup of tea. And when Bill came in on the board, I resigned. I got voted over. I was a director. I was unconstitutional director. I shouldn't have been a director, but John Blacklaw made me a director and manager. So I, when Bill came over, it was obvious that Bill Hunter was going to take the club over, and I, I resigned. And what was the gap then to your next job? Well, I thought I'd done so well at Meadowbank, I thought I was going to be inundated with offers of jobs. <laughs> and I got one offer for Cowden Beath, and the, for the chairman phoned me and I met him in the Sheraton Hotel and the interview assured me I had the job but days went mm. by I hadn't heard sometimes so maybe I haven't got this job but I was an in-service course I remember as a head teacher and on the way there I bought the Daily Record and I read the Daily Record Andy Harrow appointed manager to count me <laughs> so at the tea break in the morning interval in the course I picked up the phone and phoned the chairman oh no 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 Terry no no that's not right but it was right and I, get, I never heard anything then I remember going on holidays in September the September weekend with my mother and her friend Uncle Bill and my wife and my and Susan and my daughter Carol going down to Southport for the holidays and out of football in September so I was a little bit fed up because I thought you know with the success at Meadowbank, yeah. I would have been knocking back the offers. Yeah, with the resources at your disposal there uh, as well. And then Stennis Muir asked me to be manager. Now, Stennis Muir was the second worst team in Scotland, you know. Uh, yeah. And the first game we played, Queen's Park, we were the worst team. And we, we beat my first game there. 
And then things started to improve at Stenhus I Muir. Mean, I managed yeah. to get players, you know. And then you went on to win the Challenge Cup final, of course. Is that the highlight of there? I mean, aside from maybe one off games, spectacular victories and cups and things, is the Challenge Cup final, is that achievement of winning that, is that the biggest thing? Or is it the success at Meadowbank over the piece? I think the success at Meadowbank is the best thing I did mm. as a manager because when I left Meadowbank, they were starting the seventh successive season in the Championship. Now, if you yeah. take Edinburgh City, who've done really well, you know, the Edinburgh City have now in the championship for seven years, and that's what Meadowbank did. In nowadays, you have the security of the playoffs if you finish in second but bottom place. Then there was no there was no security of your playoff. You know, you can still save yourself. But the Meadowbank story is really quite amazing how well Meadowbank did. And then when I went to Stenhouse Muir, we picked them up, and they got up off the bottom league. And then we had two great results. We knocked Aberdeen out of the cup, you know, which was... Uh, which was quite something. I was going to ask you about that. You obviously, you took some major scalps in your career. The Aberdeen result probably being the most famous one. I mean, how do you prepare your team for a game like that when you have 11 obviously inferior players to theirs? Yeah. And they'd just beaten Rangers, hadn't they? Eight Roy Aitken had just taken the job and they'd just beaten Rangers. They'd just beaten Rangers and I was at the game with Graham Armstrong, my assistant manager. They'd beaten Rangers and we went back in the car giving ourselves no chance. They were terrific mm. again. Aberdeen had a mm. real good team. They were terrific against Rangers. But what you know, we had a good team and we just played our normal game and we had, you know, I always feel you've got to be really good in defence, right? And, but you have to have some attacking strategies. You know, can't win the football one, you know, let's just go to go. You know, we played our usual game. I knew, I knew how they played and our lads played out their skin. You know, we had one or two early moments early on in the game. But over the piece, normally when you have a surprise result, you get the lion's share of luck in that game I felt we were actually the better team than Aberdeen mm-hmm. and beat them 2-0 When you got these kind of fantastic results did you do a lot of man marking of the other team's danger men or was it more about how your team played? I didn't man mark it was a balance you know you'd man mark say somebody especially a big lad at a corner kick or something and give special attention to some players you know I remember playing Kilmarnock sometimes you'd man mark in Kilmarnock in the, in the cup and they had Ian Durant of Rangers fame. Yeah. Now, Ian Durant got that terrible injury, but he was playing Kilmarnock. He was still a wonderful player. And I did man-mark him. Son Max went mm-hmm. man-marked him and did a great job. And we knocked Kilmarnock out of the cup. So occasionally, if they have a special player, you would give him special attention, as I did with Ian Durant that day. But normally, you play your own game, but keep it tight at the back. Quite often, when you play a back four... If they've got white players, they can the white players can get space in the ball, and you find a full back something to try and cover for centre backs to get out to the white player. So if, when I played the better teams, I tended to play with three centre backs, so we could actually reduce the spacing at the back and mark the, the white players tight. And also we played, we didn't let the ball go in behind us. I mean, yeah, centre my centre backs didn't go short and chase the ball; they stayed in shape. So you could have the ball in front of us, but you weren't getting behind us. <laughs> you know? Yeah. If a striker came off. My centre back, he was allowed to go. He was allowed to come off the centre back state. And you mentioned Max. There, Max played for you at three of your clubs. Is that right? He played at all three. Yes, yeah. I. And probably had his most successful spells there. Do you think is is that the family connection? Is that a player wanting to do the absolute best for you, or is it about you knowing how to use him best? Or well, I think it was. I think there was a, a part of both in that. You know, Max started as a sixteen-year-old at Hearts. And that didn't work out for him. So I bought him off hearts. I paid quite a bit of money for him. And then he came to us and then Dundee bought him. But Max was... The thing, obviously, if you play your son, as I did in three teams, people would think that's favouritism. But in Max's case, that wasn't the case. Max was a good player. You know, he wasn't the perfect player by any means. He would frustrate me and he would shout and ball at me. And, you know, if and, but the other players never seemed to mind, you know. You yeah. treat all players the same. That never worked with Max. I mean, you know Max. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And yeah. if I... You know, he can, he's a... He's got a bit of a temper, Max, so so that never uh, worked with Max. But he was he's such a likeable lad, Max, and he was a real try-hard footballer. Strong lad, who got wired in, as they say. I mean, I played with him at Porty Thistle in a team that also had Paul Telfer, who went on to become successful did, at Coventry yeah, and Celtic. Great things, and, I. and Chris Reid was our goalie and again yeah. played for Hamilton and Hibbs. And it was a tremendous team, but you could see that Paul Telfer and Max were just a wee level above, you know. There's another kid called Gavin who was a good player. Nah, Gavin was a very good player. Yeah, yeah. he's a good player, but Max and Paul, and I, and I still remember Max's last game for Porty Thistle. You might, you've maybe got too many football memories, but Max's last game for us, we were playing Salvi, and we just, you know, we'd won everything the year before, then we'd gone to juvenile level, and it was 2 2 after nine minutes, and we lost 15 2. 
<laughs> and it was after that game that Max went to Hutchie, I think. Yeah, I think he went to Salva to start with. Yeah, yeah, it was maybe yes, maybe a state to Salva. And your last job at Alloa, again, some cup shocks. Happy memories of those days. Well, by the time I went to Alloa, I mean, I was doing two jobs for a lot, lot of years. You know, I went to Alloa. I was getting late fifties, and I was getting a wee bit tired, but because it was a big strain on me, yeah. You know? But then we had a good team at Alloa, and, and we we won the Challenge Cup, beating Inverness. And we were, we were a really good team so I was lucky at Alloa we had one special player a lad Willie Irvin who'd actually played for the Hibs was yeah. in the twilight of his career but yeah. he was very good in the air as well wasn't he he was great at everything he was, yeah. wasn't quick but he was a special player at that level okay, I have a good memory at Alloa and we got promoted twice didn't manage to stay in the championship but if there had been playoffs then I'm sure we would have stayed in the championship you know yeah. once you, which is football brings you a lot of heartaches the, the victories never compensate for the defeats and on the last game of the season at Alloa we beat St Mirren 5-1 but Ross County had won and we got relegated on goal oh, difference dear. now if it was a current situation we'd have been playing off with the top of the, the league one and we'd have hammered them yeah. <laughs> or when you look at your career in, in management You've done so many marvellous things with wee teams and limited budgets and a lot of players towards the end of their careers. When you look at your career, it is amazing that you didn't get that shot. I know there was the the heartbreak of missing the Hibs job three times. Did you think you had it three times, the Hibs job? Yes, yes, I I thought I'd had the Hibs job three times, but that never materialised, so... Yeah, but the, the fact that you didn't get that chance at higher level, that mu- it must be a regret, is it? Or do you just look back? Well, there's no point in looking back and regretting mm-hmm. things, eh? You just yeah. look forward, try and enjoy life. So no, I never I never look back and regret. I don't yeah. dwell on the past, you know? They Actually, you, you don't shot. dwell much on the good times either, unless yeah. I'm with some of my old pals that played for yeah. Middle Bank, and we'll maybe talk about the past. But, the, but that seldom, you just... I worry more about my golf now, you know? <laughs> How did it feel to just be doing the one job after all that time well, actually, of doing I'd, the two? I packed in the, the teaching before the Alloa. I did, okay. did Alloa for a couple of months. But by the time I, I resigned, when I packed, I was 60 years old and I'd been in football for 43 years. And I'd been running this head teacher at Musselburgh Grammar School, which is a challenging job for 16 years. And I was knackered. And I packed in. And then Alloa decided, the board, you know, that they were going to really cut back and give me no money for players. So the team I had that just got relegated, unluckily from the first division, they sort of fell apart because of the money. And I should have packed in. I mean, Alloa weren't really all that supportive of me I was disappointed in them and I should have I should have just called it a day then so we started the season poorly and I thought no I can't go on with this and that's it so at 60 year old I, I resigned Yeah, and that must have been a remarkable transformation in your life then to have been so busy for so long with these two jobs of being a manager and being a teacher then a head teacher and then having none of that how did you adjust to that well I thought well I'll go back and do some teaching and I did do actual classroom teaching for a couple of years you know I taught Mm -hmm. at uh, Ross Academy and I taught at Knox Academy teaching by teaching chemistry and physics at at Ross Uh, but that's hard work (laughs) that was hard work being back and it's not the same discipline in kids when you're not the head teacher you know they don't know who's that old guy (laughs) Uh, and uh, so how long were you out of teaching before you did what made your uh, minor comeback then Oh, I was only a few months I went right. back. But then I didn't do that long. And then I became... Uh, so I was looking for something to do. I became general manager at Duddingston Golf Club, a golf club right. that I'd been a member for many years. And I did that for three years. That was a diff- totally different job, difficult job. And you've worked... And there's a committee structure and you've got to work with a committee here. And maybe that didn't suit me. I haven't listened to all the committee and their ideas. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I did three years of that. And then uh, I've been totally retired since. But I was a, a Premier League delegate for eight years. You, you attend matches and write a report on the conduct of the game and the referee and they have the system whereby the the, uh, the manager can speak to the delegate about the referee without getting into trouble you, usually they're not very complimentary <laughs> but, well they're never complimentary mm-hmm. so I did that for eight years but then I, I, I enjoyed that because you get the best seat in the stand you know yeah. to watch the game but then because the, the of the cost saving and there's fewer police at games. So the health and safety side was pushed more onto the club and onto the delegate with more of the, the security people there. So the job became a health and safety job with less about football. So they wanted me to stay on, but no, I'd, uh, I packed that in. And since then, I've been watching Max as managed junior teams, he's managed bonus in the Lowland League. Yeah. So our whole family are Bonnes United supporters now. We yeah. go to all the Bonnes, Bonnes games. And is Max, is he happy where he is? Or, I mean, you have to say you're happy where you are as a football manager, but is he looking up the way? 
Well, you know, I think he would be if he he would I think welcome a chance to to manage at a higher level. I, yeah. think, I think he's been a bit unlucky not to get that. You yeah, know. he's done well, hasn't he? He's done very well. Eh? He won the Super League with Bonnerig and he's got bonus into the the Lowland League, so he's done really well. And I think he's been a bit a little bit unlucky not to get yeah. the chance at a higher level because you know him. He's got that nice personality with him. People take to him, and he's got a good yeah. knowledge of football. So he's a good manager. And he's relatively young too. Still a chance, yeah. <laughs> Still a chance. <laughs> and uh, looking back on your teaching career, for I've, I've got a couple of pals doing teacher training at the moment, what with all those years of experience, is there, is there any kind of bits of advice that you'd like to have been told when you started out on that teaching journey with regard to Well, I went to... Uh, I mean, you do a year's teaching party. I went 9, 65, 66, I went to Murray House. But teaching was expanding, and that was a complete waste of time. They taught you nothing, you know. You did nothing. It was just just to carry on. You were going to get your teacher qualification, you know, just for turning up. Nobody really... You learn yourself. But, you know, if you were... When I'm talking, everybody be quiet and look at me. And, yeah. You know, if you can do that, then you're well on your way to being a good teacher. Yeah. And try and get a bit of humour and make the level interesting and get the kids working rather than listening to you. You know, just common sense things. If you're good with people, you'll probably be a good teacher. Yeah? But it's more to than that. You've got to be prepared. And prepar- and teaching preparation is everything. You've got to prepare your lesson. Yeah. When I was a manager, I typed out all my team talks on a Friday night. Didn't really refer to them much, but I typed out everything and we went into tiny, tiny details about how players should play and really was maybe the, one of the very first managers to have set plays, you know, and we did a lot of mixtures of zonal and man marking. Mm. And the players were, people would say, overcoached. And because we were playing against teams that were better than us, we did play very, you know, keeping ourselves in shape and so on. So preparation and teaching is everything. You go into a lesson, you're not prepared, you're, going to, you're generally going to make a mess of it. And do you watch much football these days, then, Terry? And, and my other, my follow-up question to that at the same time, do you watch it with an analytical eye or do you just enjoy it? Well, I, I watch Bonnet United, obviously, but I watch football with an analytical political eye and start shouting at the television. <laughs> I really do. Do you know, I'm a, I'm a Hibs man. I, I go to try and get to Hibs games. And I've always been Hibs and my English team's Arsenal who are having a terrible time and a, the manager's doing really badly. Mm-hmm. Think about football managers. If you get a group of football guys together and they talk about football, they'll all be sort of general agreement. But when you're the manager, there's a lot of ways to play football. You have to decide which way am I going to play it? And it strikes me, lots of people can't do that. I mean, the average career for a manager is about a year and three months. They cannot do that. And other things you have to be able to do, obviously sign good players, but then have a clear thing, idea in your mind about the pecking order of players. Who's the good players, right? And play the good players in your team, you know? And the Arsenal manager has no idea who's good players. <laughs> I doesn't seem to have any clue. For example, Willie Ormond was the, the Scotland team manager in 1974 went to the World Cup. Now, we Willie would, wasn't, wasn't a coach, but we Willie could pick the football team, pick yeah. his best players. And if you can pick your best players, you're halfway there. If you can sign good players, that's the other part, and pick, them, and pick the proper players and, yeah. and give them the remnants of a system, you have a chance of doing well. But if you don't know who your good players are, you're lost. And Willie Ormond had some phenomenal players at his disposal. Ah, oh, Willie Ormond, died, and, and Willie Ormond again was such a likable character. You know, he, he was uh, like Alec McDonald at Rangers, which was so likable. Everybody liked him. The players, you know, worshipped yeah. him and so on. So the per- and Jim Leishman, the personality of the manager is so important. If they have a bit, you know, likability. The mm-hmm. players will respond to that. Did you have any players that you managed throughout your career? I mean, your teams were perhaps of a certain. They played a certain way, but did you have any players of the? the Cantona style that you'd say to them just go out and enjoy yourself do you have I, any of those I, guys I never ever say go out and enjoy yourself no, no. <laughs> once, you, once you enter the life of professional football it's not about enjoying yourself you're yeah. at your work now you're lucky you can do a, a job and that do a job that you enjoy but no they were, they were go out and given a job to do and try and play to their strengths that's another thing you've got to do you know but I, I had some very good players you know I had Darren Jackson as a kid who was playing for Meadowbank when he was 18 year old and then Alan Lawrence I mean we played once up at uh, St Johnston and my strikers were Darren Jackson and Alan Lawrence and we beat St Johnston 5-1 that's Meadowbank this will beat St Johnston 5-1 so we had good players and you the better the player, the more freedom you give them. And you've got two boys and a girl. Uh, Max, Kevin and, Car- and Carol. Any any great-grandchildren yet? Oh, no. No, no, point no, I don't, uh, no I'm no great-grandchildren, but I might get their great-grandchildren. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and at this point, in the small family section, can, can we ask you the legendary story of how you met your wife? Uh, well, or has that been told too many times? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, school disco at Portobello, 
Well, I, my first wife, I was married twice. So Margaret was, uh, my first wife was my childhood sweetheart. And I met her when I think I was 17 and she was 14. And we got mm. married. And we were married 19 years and we had Kevin and Max. And we really had a wonderful marriage. But as can happen, you drift apart and we separated and got divorced. So for a couple of years, I was living in a flat in Leith myself. A lot of the time with two boys, two wayward sons who were not always behaving as they should have. And uh, I had no girlfriends or anything. Mickey Lawson said there's a, an old ex-girlfriend of his is leaving work, to, leaving Scotland to work in, I think, South Africa and just having a farewell party where you come. So I went to the party. It wasn't much of a party. And Mickey and I, at the very end of it, got up two girls to dance. And the girl I got up to dance started screaming. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Christian being an ex-pupil of mine. Now, that was 36 years ago. So that ex-pupil of mine is Susan Christie who I've been married to her and I've been together for these 36 years oh, That's wonderful How do you guys spend your time these days? What, how do you fill your retirement? Well, we're very family I mean, I mean uh, we do a lot with family together I mean, Max lives around the corner and my daughter Carol lives down the road Kevin's a bit further distant but he works for Clarity Max has got a, a company, Clarity with Susan and Max started it up and it's uh, financial advisors and they're doing very well so Kevin who was a gifted journalist, had his own column in the, the Scotsman, but there's no money in journalism, as you, you might know, Barry. So he's, he's packed out and got himself qualified as a financial advisor. So they have, we have a sort of family business, which is Max and, and to a lesser extent, Susan business. But so we're a very close-knit family. We see each other all the time. We all go to bonus games. His sister and Kevin and her her partner and her wee boy. There's a wee boy. She's got a wee boy called Terry. So oh, there's nice. two wee Terrys in the family. <laughs> <laughs> How are the pies at bonus? All right. No, the pies could the pies have a, a wee bit to go in the pies. <laughs> and your hopes for the future, Terry? Have you got any unfulfilled dreams or goals? Not really. No, not. just to keep enjoying life and make sure my. My kids and everybody around about me are doing well, yeah. Maybe when Jack Ross goes, maybe that one last shot at the show. <laughs> He's doing great. No, no, I just didn't. I do enjoy football and I've got to start, stop shouting at the telly, yeah. <laughs> and I have to ask, does the legendary duff coat, does it still hang in a cupboard somewhere? Has Max ever worn it on um, the touchline? No, no, the, the coat, duff coat was originally Max's and I ruined a, a nice coat I had and I was going to a game, you know, a nice coat, I'd got soaked, got drenched and I just grabbed this coat. And then we beat Aberdeen and my picture was not on the paper. So it became a bit of a, a lucky mascot, the duffel coat. And then when that one wore out, I got marked too. So I've had two duffel coats and they're both lying in the cupboard. <laughs> but they're very, you know, they're, uh, they're a bit, pa- they're like me a bit past... <laughs> And we're just drawing to a close here. Just a couple more questions. How did it feel as a fan to see Scotland qualify for the first time in 22 years for a major tournament? And where did you watch it, if you did watch it? Oh, I did watch it. I watched it on television. I love Scotland. You know, you've, if you're Scottish, you you really are a keen Scotland fan. I love Scotland to do well. And I think we've got some good players just now, you know. So, I no, I'm, I'm delighted. And But they have good players. They've got a good manager. And I think you've got to be patient. I mean, the thing that does annoy me is that, you know, a couple of bad results get rid of the manager. We're not going to get a better manager than Steve Clark. Yeah. And we've got good players. We've got Tierney, McGinn. You know, Kevin Nisbet's going to be a good player. We have good players. We've got Armstrong. We've got a, a surfeit of good midfielders. Uh, we're short maybe at strikers and short a wee bit in defence. But we've good players and we've got to show a wee bit of patience and give the manager a chance. And... Can I have your prediction for the SPL title and the English Premiership title this year, please, Terry? Oh, well, it's Rangers, and I think... Uh, well, Arsenal have no chance. I'd like Liverpool. I'm a big Liverpool fan. Like, everybody's yeah. a Liverpool it's fan. Always good to watch. Oh, I love Liverpool. Uh, but I think it'll be... Um, I don't know. Maybe Man United or Ronaldo. I yeah. don't know. No, I think it'll be Man City. And, um, you know, but... Who knows? I think it's very tight. I think it's tighter than it's been with Man City, Man United and Liverpool really going to be, you know, chasing each other down. And your epitaph, Terry, how, how would you like to be remembered? Have you got an inscription for the Christie tombstone? Oh, no, no inscription, no. Never thought of that. No, I just think you, you, you come here, you do your best. And the thing I used to say, I used to give uh, assemblies all the time to the kids at Musselburgh as a head teacher. And I always found it quite you know, difficult trying to tell people how to live their lives because I've been far from perfect in my life. (laughs) So I usually just had one message which was be nice to each other, you know? 
and occasionally I'm not nice to people but then when I'm not nice to folk and I, because I've got a temper I'm Irish I've got a temper and I can snap and I do that too often but then generally try and, and then I say I'm sorry <laughs> so generally try and be nice to each other that's my message Terry thank you so much for joining us on Life Story it's been a pleasure thank you Barry thanks again If you've enjoyed this podcast, our further reminiscence and music shows Life Story, Leith Lives, Forgotten Songs from the Broom Cupboard, and Analog Rory's Jukebox can all be accessed from the Projects tab on our website or via Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If you have a story to share, please pop in to see us at the Wee Museum of Memory on the second floor of Ocean Terminal in Leith. You can also visit our Facebook page to keep up with our regular events and view our wonderful photo videos and much more on our YouTube channel just by searching for the Living Memory Association. We also have a brilliant website at www.livingmemory.org.uk hosting over 3,000 photos in conjunction with Edinburgh Collected. Until next time, we bid you farewell. <laughs>